Hello and it's great to have you with us. You're with Echelon's She Slays and we've got three formidable ladies with us uh, who have achieved uh, remarkable things in the last decades. We have Aruni Rajakaria, who uh, has been a banker. She has worked in education. Uh, she's now the founder of She Consults. She also sits in several boards of listed companies. We have Nadia Jatambaya, who is a lawyer, uh, is working potentially for Sri Lanka's largest listed company, uh, John Cale's Holdings. She's a president uh, there. She's uh, Nadija, you've been there 19 years. Last 26 years. 26 years. Wow, that's a brilliant <laughs> career. And uh, last but not least, we have Shahara De Silva. Uh, Shahara has had a long career in advertising, marketing, in insurance. Uh, she's worked both in Sri Lanka and overseas. Um, uh, she is now a uh, non-executive director at several listed companies, right? Uh, ladies, thank you very much for joining She Slays. It's really an honor to have you here with us today. Uh, let me just get straight to some uh, some, some of the talking points. Uh, what do you think women, young girls currently are challenged with? You know, and we are not just addressing young women, we are addressing a general audience, but uh, where, where do you think they are likely to be surprised? Uh, where do you think they are likely to be challenged by uh, the average person out there? Can I start with you, Nanesh? Sure. I was thinking about this question, actually, and, and I actually think that um, the tragedy is that most of the women from privileged backgrounds do not go into the workplace. Um, that's uh, an issue that I'm fighting. But let's let's start with your first question um, of where do you think the problem is? Because you look at school and you look at how hard the girls work at school, whether it's in the rural areas, in government schools, in private schools, they work equally hard. And the results are that they outperform at O level, they outperform at A level, they outperform at university entrance and at graduation. So you're having a drive and you're having an ambition for 20 years. So why are they not transiting in? Some of the other data also is that in certain professions, like in certain um, industries, like the government sector, the women reach the top. They stay in and they reach the top because they have um, almost a, 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 a set number of hours and they may not have to um, fight their way in, okay? Because women are not aggressors generally. So if, but they have the ambition and the hard work to get up there. There are certain professions also that you see these women reaching the top now. Like accountancy is one, law is another, HR is it's perhaps a third. So, uh, um, so you have to look at why they're not making it into certain places and why they are making it to certain places. And some of it is internal to the woman. A, large, a very important part of it is internal to the woman because biologically, whether we like it or not, we are the bearers of the children. We have to grow a child in our wombs for nine months. We have to nurse that child. We will inevitably have to look after that child when it's sick. So the Biologically, we are programmed to prioritize that. We can't get away with that. And um, get away from that, I should say. So when you have that, and if you have organizations that recognize that, but still value the women enough to bring it back, that's when you break that chain. So there are some, I think, who will be conditioned. I had parents very similar to Aronis, who, didn't, who never envisaged that I would not work. Both are working parents. My mother worked very hard, to, um, longer than my father did. So I knew it was possible. And I also, in my mind, didn't think it was uh, a choice. Um, so part of it is internal. Part of it is the conditioning to know that you, it is natural to feel that guilt. It is natural to feel that conflict. And what, do you, what are the things that you can do to manage that? Um, but there's also, I think, a part where um, there are a lot of men in decision-making boards and they don't recognize those difficulties. 
right? So they will say, look, it costs more to hire a woman because I have to pay for her during her maternity leave. I have to um, invest in her knowing that she's going to spend less time. Um, and it, it doesn't make business sense for me, right? So there's, there's also men, and you, you, I don't want to talk about unconscious bias, who will, when they think about who to appoint onto boards or into certain positions, will naturally think certain roles are not suited for women. Those are external factors that I think are preventing women from getting up. To add to that, I, I must say, uh, sometimes you're really fortunate to have a great husband who looks after yes. the kids. My kids, when they're sick, completely looked after by my husband. Uh, they naturally want him there. I don't know what's missing. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's good to have the conversations. And for young women of today, I think some are afraid to have the conversations with their spouses, their siblings, uh, and, and even their children, you know. We don't have to tie their shoelaces. We need to teach them to tie their shoelaces. And that's a concept that I would really like to tell women, empower your children with the skills they need to be independent. An independent child is a, a joy at home because they're confident they will be better. Uh, an independent man, a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, so they need to have the conversations. And I think women internalize and wait until the pressure builds to have that conversation. That is the wrong way. It, Women should ask for a helping hand. Ask, hey, uh, not even a helping hand. Ask, can you do this for me? Or can you do this for us? Right? Shared chores, chore lists. All those things are possible to share that burden so that everybody collectively moves together. Isn't that the dream? Just shift the narrative mm. because I think you know, the three of us spend time, this is a reality and I'm not sure. dismissing it, but the work family narrative is where we end up getting strung up it and in, mm. in a short interview I would like to also say that if we also focus on the fact that like Nadija said where you know in the school system and right up to university we are finding that we are producing more women and they were as educated or smarter and we're totally capable suddenly there is a sort of cultural shift that you know if there has to be a choice in homemaking that that it is a woman and we tend to of default fault it but let's move on to other other aspects of it and i think that's where where young women need to know that you know if you go out there there is enough of data and research to say that because we are because we are good at juggling and multitasking that in a point of crisis uh, in terms of leadership uh, women are far better at managing chaos <laughs> and chaos is now just a default setting in the world right and you saw that in terms of world leaders to everything else you see that around companies you're saying that diversify boards or right across teams that they bring in different whether it's empathy whether it is certain strengths and i think we must reiterate some of that right let's look for you know you, you can say yeah you're always multitasking but don't be apologetic about it you know at the end of it we wing it somehow right and it's an important skill to have uh, similarly if you look at a younger generation you will find that um, there is less of the issues that we grappled with I think a millennial will not see it in the same way. We are grappling with fuddy-duddy board members and senior people who fundamentally are just not going to get it. But there is a world out there that is definitely changing. And I would just advise any young woman out there, never ever let anybody tell you you're second to none or that childbearing or family or culture or anything needs to stand you in the way. They're all there, they're all there. And we still can and we will. We can rule the world. Nothing should stop us. And, and if we continue this conversation about the world of work, sure, we recognize that you know, women have to juggle uh, responsibilities that come because of the stereotypical expectation, particularly in matriarchal societies like ours, I think, right? But uh, look at the world of work. And, and if, if, if we were to address 
one or two things in the world of work and if we were to tell young people hey th- these are the first sorts of hurdles that you are likely to hit what are those likely hurdles that they are likely to uh, that they're going to hit first particularly young girls in the work- workplace okay if i may start uh the word, the phrase manage your time has been there around i'll add to that and say manage your energy uh i i'm a great believer in doing what needs to get done first thing in the morning i wake up at an insanely early hour and i get the stuff done so that by the time the calls start coming in i'm ready to be disturbed almost right uh so i i'd say manage your energy and that uh, you know the working late habit sometimes really takes a lot out of you because you're not that productive at the end of the day whereas you're very productive in the morning uh so that might be for me uh, what I, the advice i would give to someone young to it early narija um balance similar to her mm. i think um if you are trying to live a full life and have a full career there is balance you have to you cannot dedicate 100% of your time and energy to your work and then try and have a full life outside of work as well right and it's never going to be a perfect 50-50 there will be times where you have to give 80% of your time and energy as such to your work and it sometimes when you have to give 80% to your family life but fine realize that there's a balance and in that balance is compromise I tend to agree but uh, I I'm not your I'm not quite into your energy method because I'm just wired differently yeah. so I tend to muster up spurts of energy which I can get kind of crazily have drive and manage to do things but I work smart sometimes mm, because no, I'm very yeah, conscious of my time uh balance I've never really achieved I aspire to no. it all the time but <laughs> I I've realized that it's some kind of you know assist that that I'm not going to really arrive at because uh, you know there's too much going on but I think horses for courses so different people if you're very structured yes I think starting early managing your time would be one uh so I just say that whichever way you need to find out what works within your psyche your character and then build around it but uh humor might be very very useful because yeah. there are times in which without humor i think none of us <laughs> uh, the slings and arrows of uh, you know of uh, patriarchy does hurt at times yeah. has has the has the current working environment you know we, we are wired we are online all the time there is that expectation that that you are contactable now like like you weren't 20, you know 10 or 20 years ago but you think women at a particular disadvantage i think so uh so i think by the time covid hit my kids were much older they could manage online stuff by themselves but for mothers who had young kids they they it it was terrible uh you know that some schools scheduled the classes uh, to be uh to be in line with the times that the moms are at home so they finish a full day at work they go home and they do maybe another 1 hour to 2 hours of studies with the kids where they need to be around then manage everything else as well mother so, yeah mothers with young kids had it really tough i was uh, it was easier for me i think it was michelle obama said some 20 million women left the workplace yes oh. uh during covid because that you you um suddenly had the household living and eating three meals a day in the house with children studying from home and where do you think who did all of that mm. <laughs> yeah i i've i've had young people who i mentor who might be in their 40s and they're definitely you know ceo material mm. and they're they're driven mm. they're very capable but they were going bats because on the one hand you're having three sometimes three different people working so the kids are doing their tuition mm. or their their online classes husband is working wife is working sometimes housing is small mm. and 
there is an expectation that you also manage the things like when the pipe is broken, you fix it, where you sort out the, uh, you know, food on the table, because now you're home based, mm. right? Mm. So it's it's taken its toll even on, on good marriages to everything. It's 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 really put pressure on women particularly. Yes. Uh, because also, as you say, time has been elastic. People call, there's no discipline, they'll call at all sorts of odd hours. Having said that, though, I think technology um, theoretically makes it easier for women because it gives them the flexibility. And um, I, our studies at least have been that at a certain stage in a woman's life, that flexibility becomes key to her remaining in the workplace. So we have people who are working yeah. almost always at home or coming into work when she can sort of thing to manage certain parts, you know, when the, just after maternity, when a child is sick. Mm. Um, so that flexibility, I think, has been key to retaining women on the workplace and, and in the career ladder. So something that's happened, and this is something you alluded to a little earlier, Nadija, also is that the pace of work has transformed, you know, uh, over the last maybe decade, right? You know, uh, I, I think that we are online, that uh, that, that we can be contacted anytime. Uh, technology has had a lot to do with changing how work is done currently. Uh, uh, Aruni says maybe that's proven to be slightly disadvantageous to women. How, uh, what advice would you have? How, how would you tell women to react to this? You know, is, is that so? That's a bit of a <laughs> chauvinistic so, question, yeah. isn't it? Why does it only affect women? It affects yeah. men and women. The I pace of work is killing I women. was about to say, my, I mean, I, 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 I'm the wrong person to ask, but if mm. you ask my husband, uh -huh. he will turn off his phone at 5.30. Right. Um, and he won't, op he won't open it again until 7 the next morning. And that's the way you should manage it. <laughs> <laughs> and Shamir, if I may add, technology in the sense with COVID, what happened? But for us, technology has been the platform we built our business on. Because from the beginning, uh, we set it up as a remote working operation for moms or women who had other responsibility to work from home. So we've been on you know, Microsoft 365. We give them training on how to be productive. And it's, for us, the great equalizer between mm. a developing country and the advanced world we have the same access to technology because these are subscription-based, real-time updated software. And we now have that same capability, which we didn't have with earlier uh, versions which were not subscription-based, right? Uh, so technology I see as a great equalizer and it allows women to fly in, in that sense, but on that communication angle and the way the pandemic was managed, put a lot of pressure which mm. brought on the great resignation, mm. not just for women I, but for men. I think also maybe you may have some data awareness related to mental health issues that have, have escalated during this period. And that's because we're social beings, right? So mm. the outlet of one side, you know, sort mm. of whether it's at the water cooler or going out for lunch with a colleague or, you know, something that, that human interaction maybe even getting away from abusive situations in home yeah. because there's a fair amount of domestic violence and stuff like that. Mm. So for many reasons, I think it's more complex. I mean, it's, it's an enabler, mm. uh, but it also puts you out there sometimes where you don't have, uh, you don't have the same outlets that the, the old uh, bricks and mortar you know, office space had. Sure. If, if you step out of the organizations that you're currently in, that you're currently working for or represent in any indirect fashion and, and look at what particularly the private sector, maybe even government organizations can do uh, that are low hanging fruit that that can potentially engage women, uh, give them uh, give them options or give them purpose. Uh, what do you think are those big opportunities that we have? Employee supported childcare is one big one, I think. Um, because if it would make it um, uh, the norm, socially acceptable, physically safe, um, to have, to send your child into a crash mm. or into a daycare, I think um, you'd have a lot of women coming back. Yeah. 
um, the, the organizations that do have employee uh, support of childcare has seen, so Unilever, so the law firms, they, they use it and they've seen huge results. That's one big one. Um, I also think you, <laughs> I don't know whether he knows this, I do think that there are some rather drastic um, measures that the private sector and, and the state can do. And that, that will force women into certain things, okay? Um, and uh, the, the, the evidence um, coming out of a lot of countries that have imposed quotas, whether mm. voluntary or mandatory, um, has seen numbers move up significantly. So a lot of companies and a, and a lot of institutional investors are asking for data on um, uh, company quotas and then against performance. So John Keels just announced a 40%, a five-year target of a 40% across the board of females. And then we will In work. senior management or in boards? Across the board. Right. Across the board. Um, and so that has then forced us to look at our pipelines, look at the interventions that are required, look at our hiring policies. So it, 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 it drives a certain mm. amount of change. Um, the SEC, as you know, announced um, a 30% quota in 2019, and they're now looking at it again as part of the listing rules for listed company boards. So there are things like that that have made it work and the reason we I think we need it is that if you look at the last 20 years nothing has really moved you had senior women 20 years ago in, in yeah, the workplace right. I mean, the numbers good. haven't really moved so is this what, what we says, need share a positive yes, discrimination just before that uh, I'll, I'll add to your question but there's also research again to show that transportation is a particularly uh, disabling factor uh. Uh, so the other is schooling, the schooling hours. When they changed it to 1.30, it made it problematic for women. When it was a two session school, or school lasted longer, it helped. Mm -hmm. Again, these have to be properly researched, but there, there is feedback coming that it does not help women for, for those reasons. Uh, I think if you move down the line, and if you look at not maybe co the corporate world, but the three big sectors are apparel, there's migrant labor, mm -hmm and there's domestic labor that, that we need to look at very specifically in terms of women's employment because those are very big sectors mm. in which uh, women are employed. And there are, I mean, I would think mandatory some kind of 10% uh, or 12% or 20% being kept even if it's in a very basic account. If you don't do the EPF, ETF for, for domestic labor, stuff like that, but equal pay, uh, studies are showing there's still a lot of disparity. So I think it's a very complex reason, but why should women be out there working for less, mm. right? Yeah. Um, lots of things that have to be, are very, very basic, uh, that need to be fixed. To take up on Shehara's point, uh, computing pay gaps, I mean, that's something we really should be doing, gender reporting. And the Institute of Chartered Accountants has put out a gender reporting framework, and I hope more corporates actually look at the pay gaps to understand the issues that are at play, and then bridge them. When so, it's mandatory in UK, it's mandatory in Australia, which have much less to gain than Sri Lanka from closing the gender gap. We can gain, I think, 14 and a half percent on GDP. Right, and uh, one of the McKinsey researchers said on Asia pa Pacific they had done, Sri Lanka is this stands to gain the second highest amount by uh, bringing more women into by the bringing world. women. Plus, we have an aging population. They, there are compelling reasons. This is a national issue that corporates should be looking at their gender policies, the enablers, the uh, the, the quant quantitatives, and also to look at their uh, communications. You know, the TV advertisements reach our homes every day. They shape cultures, whether you like it or not. I think we should make sure that women are not always portrayed in the kitchen or with the salad bowl, <laughs> but give us the tools that we are using now. Portray us with that or else put us with the man near the salad bowl, you know? 
share that uh, show that it's being shared so how responsible are corporates when they structure their wonderful marketing uh, or, or the media that they must have filters to ensure that they don't do gender stereotyping and they transform the aspirations for the next generation we've discussed several things that can be done there is uh, potentially employer employer supported uh, child care uh, positive discrimination if if that's something that can be done in the workplace you know uh, nadija talked about how john keels is potentially you know is it's, wanting it's a quota quota it's it's, it's, it's a, a quota target, okay. i should say it's more than a quota it's a target a quota right um but let me sort of you you didn't neither of you any uh, didn't you didn't benefit from any of these things when potentially you were young in your careers right did you at any point in your at what point in your career did it seem that you know this is not inevitable i am not going to make it you know i just you know this is it kind of did you have that point in your career at what point for what reason aruni you alluded to when you had your second kid right yeah. uh oh, to the God, two of you almost every year <laughs> right it's a constant battle to say stay in it and there are different reasons you stay in the work is interesting you may need the money in a very young stage for a long time for me it was setting the example for my two daughters right right because i wanted them to know that they have to work and be financially independent to be confident in their own abilities and that was a massive driver for me i would say for 15 the last 15 years um and now i suppose to some extent it's it's the change i can make and the change right. i can make at an at a different level so yeah but don't, don't think that this is something that you stay in constant yeah, <laughs> shehara when did your career appear most at risk to you did did that ever happen to you like nadija i think i would think that i it was there constantly i mean okay. I, i was a reluctant bride in terms of being a workaholic uh, somewhere i had some economic hits my husband fell sick and i felt i needed to keep at it uh but it's always a battle right is this the is this the right thing could i be doing something else isn't there more to life uh all sorts of things that one thinks about and then somewhere it hits you that you know you're doing it for more than yourself there is purpose there is some power that comes you could change systems you can uh you can perhaps value add in ways so then it becomes at one level gender neutral because it's not all just a woman thing of you know it's about you're in a situation where you can either you know you can contribute to society or to a company at at a broader level so many things drive you and motivate you but i think i think we're all saying roughly the same thing that somewhere purpose hits you in a big way whether purpose is as a role model to children or because you know in positions of power we can do different things purpose can be very foggy when you're young and uh, how, how do you think you got through that stage uh, because when you're young purpose doesn't hit you very strongly you know you're a cog in in in, in a big system right uh, at what point did you in your careers realize oh besides financial freedom uh the fact that you can contribute to society is a big deal i mean just just reflect back at what point did you think that that was the biggest thing you had achieved shall i jump in on that yes. yeah in my case i think i i i had ro- great role models right mm. so to me it was almost a default setting mm. if i didn't Uh, I always tell this to my kids too uh-huh. if, you know if you if you're running a 100 hour 100 uh, yard race mm. and you have a 50 yard uh, lead mm. I mean you better you better run that race at mm. least if not win it right mm. so to a certain extent I had role models my parents the, my community around me my mm. family people who did good and did something for society or mm. you know were people of substance right. so you almost feel you know if you don't do something mm. with your life mm. you'd be that way so there is a kind of a shadow of giants that you stand mm, on sometimes mm, mm. and people you respect mm. um, so that that's for me for me i think it was when my mom's mom was aging and she could no longer cope with my family of four kids uh, so my support system was you know compromised uh, at some level and so an idea formed in my head i was at that time with Uh, in the education sector we ran uh, annual report award programs i saw really you know poor annual reports i saw 
so many girls whom I thought would decorate boardrooms, not decorate, but be useful members, but that they were dropping off. And I thought, my, I can actually fix two problems with one solution. And the idea formed in my head, sitting in my room, and then I found the domain name and started. So I think, like you said, purpose shifts. You see what you can do for, for many. And then you're driven by that. Uh, sometimes there's no risk for the wicked. I wonder how we can have it. <laughs> when did it come to you, Nadeja? I mean, did you did you start with purpose in mind when you were young? No. When did it dawn no, on I, you that I hey, there's a bit of I don't think I like the, the purpose has shifted. Right, it's uh. shifted uh, constantly. But I think the one thing that's kept me steady has been people I could talk to, whether it was my mother or my father or my husband or, or another family, someone that I could, um, you know, because constantly I come from, a, uh, I'm the third or fourth generation lawyer, <laughs> and I'm constantly told, why aren't you going into practice, you know, come and join this, come and join that. And it's almost a guilt thing that I'm sitting in a company rather than going into and, and, and continuing this family tradition. But I, 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 then I run through what, you know, to having that conversation out loud has helped me. Mm -hmm. Why, you know, someone, someone saying to you, what do you want? Do mm -hmm. you want to battle it out in the court long? What is interesting you? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, what makes you get up the next morning and do this without having this fog and having that conversation and thinking about it for, I think, um, um, at least two or three days without making that immediate call has helped me stay, in, stay on course, I think. When did you realize in your career that, hey, you've got what you want, you know, you've, you, you've got Who the purpose. Who says I have what I want? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, now purpose has changed, yes. right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful for the career I've had and the life I've had and the learning I've had, really, um, and, 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 and the opportunities I've had to make a difference, but it's exhausting. <laughs> and at some point you think, okay, well, you know, you can do this and you do it to a certain point and then you're going to have to pass the baton at some point. Shehara, if, you know, you, you talked about options that you had and, and in, in some ways uh, there was a financial need, uh, there was a need for financial independence which kept you in your career, right? Um, uh, do you feel fulfilled for taking that choice or do you feel you just met a need? Absolutely. I, 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 I never live on regret and I'm, I don't regret anything. Uh, I still have, you know, things that I would like to do that I, I maybe which are interests like writing and mm. <laughs> producing a film one day and okay. stuff like that. But that's all right. I think, uh. you know, it's nice to strive for all sorts of things. Uh, so I don't know. No, the answer, simple answer is no. Sure. Uh, before we close, I'd like to discuss one area, and that's targets or quotas, right? Uh, because you, you've brought it up in conversation uh, in the last 10-15 uh, minutes, right? Um, and, and let me provoke you, right? Is this the way to, do, because, you know, in, in the private sector, capital is, allocate, capital is fairly efficiently allocated by the market. If, if the market feels, and I'm provoking you, right? If the market feels, you know, uh, it can do with more women in senior management. The incentive is already built in. Why is there a need to force that change? Shall I? Go ahead. I'm, I'm personally insulted that I know that I sit on certain boards mm. purely because I am the token woman and I don't want to be part of a quota because right. I'm bigger and better than that. But if I say no and I walk away, and I don't take that step, some other woman may not go there. And I think it's important that mm. there is some kind of gun at, at uh, you know, obstinate people's heads. You have rules in any society. Mm. There are things one conforms to. And mm. if that's the only way people learn mm. what equity is about, mm. then so be it. Mm. I think it needs to be a hybrid approach mm. because you do find that that would in some ways not necessarily be fair because you might just have token people there who are, don't merit being there. Mm. 
purely because they're of a gender or whatever, right? So uh, my, my, my view is that uh, we must dig deeper into things and we must insist that there should be no company that is uh, rewarded for excellence or, or in any way highlighted if it can't comply with what is basic uh, and is, is civilized. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that if, if they don't do it, that it is a criminal charge. And to that extent, so if you make a law and say it's mandatory, but stock exchange can put them down on a rating. There could be banks that give them a higher rate of loan. There could be many, many ways in which they feel it and they might want to do it. I, like Shahara, never wanted to be, you know, I wanted to earn my seat at the table, but having seen how slow it was to move the needle and the empirical research that's there uh, to prove that core tasks work, I've been convinced. So I've changed my position on it based on objective data. And I think I would really ask legislators and policy makers to look at the hard facts. I think the women are generally the first to oppose quotas. I certainly was. But the, the evidence is damning. When India imposed it, when Pakistan imposes, you look at the Nordic countries, the numbers, and it's not token numbers. It's not people who are sitting there who are family members and not. The professionalism of the numbers has moved up. So the, 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 there is, I think even in the last three years, there's a huge amount of evidence that quotas have been a very effective catalyst in moving these numbers up. Because once you have sight of women in leadership, the girls down the line have something to aim for. See, it's easier to become an independent director on a board than to have an executive directors. If you count the number of executive directors on boards who are women, that number is really appalling. So <laughs> there are many broken rungs on this ladder and they need a holistic, uh, it's a multi-dimensional issue, right? You need the legislators, you need the families, you need the women themselves to be part of the solution. Absolutely. And I mean, I think even John Keels, which is a very, very gender advanced or gender friendly organization, is a bit tardy on that. Yes, because of the structures of the boards. Yeah. What advice would you have to give to a young girl who is at the moment a little disillusioned about, you know, is, is a career worth it? Um, and yeah. and but potentially they're early in their career. So for me, uh, I, I found a different path. So it doesn't have to be one path. Right. There's always that lovely bend down the road and who knows where it may take you. Sure. Explore your options, find your passions. And you know, you make your dream come true. Nadija. I think there's a spark in every child, whether it's a male or female that drives them for that first 20 years. I don't think that spark extinguishes in a woman after a certain age. I think that spark is there. And give that spark the due respect of having nurtured it for 20 years. Keep that spark alive, is my respect. However you do it, keep that spark, that spark alive. I have one other thing. To the Sri Lankan women, the government invests 20 years in their education. 20 years of schooling and university. It is our responsibility as Sri Lankans to give back to that government because it needs us being economically productive for this country to rise. So I feel almost guilty at the number of women who do not feel that responsibility and that obligation to contribute after having benefited from it for 20 years. Sure. Probably tell you what I told my daughter, which is make something of your life, make a difference. It doesn't have to be in work, it could be in whatever you are, but, but be productive and give back something. 
So that's what I tell everyone. It, you don't have to be out there. You know, you could be an artist, you could be doing something that you decide is not all about money and, and then, you know, in a, in a certain box. Uh, at one time, parents told you you've got to be a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. So there are many parts, like she said, right? Uh, but that, that defined future is, I think, much more about doing something meaningful in the world that gives you a sense of purpose and at the same time makes the world in a slight way a better place. If I may add, have a wonderful circle of inspiring friends who cheer you on. <laughs> Aruni, Narija, Shahara, thank you so much for being part of She Slays.